Jared, what's up? How are you doing today? Uh, pretty good. Pretty good. We've got a big day tomorrow. How's uh, how's life with the cats in the house? Not that the wife's across the pond. Uh, it's good. The um, the cats. I mean, they love the house. Um, it's I got a couple cats, Vesper and Stripe, that don't come downstairs really. They um, they just like hanging out upstairs. So. I don't see them as much. It's kind of weird. Yeah. <laughs> Are you still using that cat room? Do they like to go in oh, there? Yeah. yeah, they love the cat room. They, in fact, we feed them at night before we go to bed and they all they all just go in the cat room and go to sleep and you know, that's fine. Oh, that's easy. They that's nice. It. Yeah. I didn't ask you last time when I was looking at your new studio, but what's up with these binders you got to your to your right back behind you? Those look serious. So that is every issue of the Daily Dirt Nap. Oh, nice. Yeah, and there's actually more. Um, it goes, there's a couple more shelves. So it goes, so I, every issue I've ever written it has been printed out and is in a binder. That's cool. Yep. All right, so let's get into this. So you were just on the Schwab Network in New York, and you wrote that it was the first time you've been to the New York Stock Exchange. So in, in Dirt Nap, you mentioned that the NYNC is a quote unquote, very weird place. I was wondering if you could elaborate a bit on that. Um, I mean, at this point, it's funny because I was looking at pictures of it and I saw a picture of it from 2010. And even in 2010, there was still some activity. There were still some floor traders, but now it's basically a handful of guys sitting around staring at computers like, there's really no floor traders or floor brokers left. And my guess is that if it weren't for the TV studios, they'd probably just shut it down. Like there's really no reason to have it open. I think the only reason they have it open is for publicity. So, um, and, and it's funny, I walked by the CNBC studio where they do the closing bell and it's like this tiny little box with a glass wall. Like when you see it on TV, you think it's like this fancy thing. It's like this tiny little room. Um, and, and the other thing is, is, you know, I did this interview on the trading floor with Nicole Petalidis and like, there's people around like it's so, so it's weird. Like there's other stuff going around. Like you hear conversations, like it's just a very strange environment, but the room, the room itself is not that big. It's a pretty small room. Like, and which I should have known. You know, I've been I've been on a bunch of exchange floors. I've been on the P Coast. I've been on the Amex. I've been on the CME. I've been on the Board of Trade. Um, I've been on the old uh, Nibot, the Coffee, Sugar, Cotton, and Cocoa Exchange. And it's really, it's just not that big. It's pretty small. When you wrote that, it reminded me of that Robert Downey Jr. Yes. Uh, YouTube video when he went to the, to the floor in the 90s and it was just pure chaos, so... I was wondering if it was anything like that, but it does not sound like it anymore. No, 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 no. Yeah. No, he was actually on the Merc. He was on the Merc. Okay. Yeah. It's a funny video. All right, let's let's transition to the market headlines this week. So first up, we've got Musk warns that he will ban Apple devices if OpenAI is integrated at operating system level. So on Monday, Apple announced a bunch of AI features across its apps and operating platforms and a partnership with OpenAI to bring the chat GPT technology to its devices, to which Musk tweeted, if Apple integrates OpenAI at the OS level, then Apple devices will be banned at my companies. That is an unacceptable security violation. He then said visitors will have to check their Apple devices at the door while they will be stored in a Faraday cage. Next up from Bloomberg, traders are bracing vol for volatility on Fed CPI double blow. So we're, we are recording this on Tuesday, but tomorrow on June 12, we've got two catalysts that can introduce some volatility, a report on consumer prices in the morning and then the Fed rate decision in the afternoon. Next from Yahoo Finance, NVIDIA stock rises after 10 for 1 stock split. So NVIDIA began trading Monday on a new 10 for 1 split basis, revising the shares Friday closing price from a little over 1200 to about 120 and the stock closed nearly 1% higher in its first day following the split. Uh, I definitely want to get back to that one in a second. But lastly, your old friend Roaring Kitty is back at it. He had a 
live stream for the first time in, I think, three years on Friday. And GameStop shares slid 12% following Friday's 40% sell-off. And that 40% sell-off was during his live stream. So that was a complete disaster. And then also during the live stream, another popular meme stock, AMC, sank around 14%. The stock is down nearly 19% so far this year. So, Jared, any thoughts on these headlines this week? Uh, I want to talk about the split. Um, you know, you have a bunch of people um, who say that splits are dumb. Uh, nobody should care about splits because if you do a 10 for one split, um, you have 10 times the shares, but the price of the stock is 10% it was before. So it's really just an accounting fiction. And why does anybody care? Like why, why do people think a split is bullish, right? Like that's irrational behavior. It's actually not irrational behavior. It's not. And I'll tell you why. So a stock split is signaling by company management. Okay. So if you think about it this way, if you have a company with a $500 stock and they're going to do a 10 for one split and they're going to have a $50 stock, they wouldn't split the stock if they thought it was going down right? That would be a huge mistake. Like if you thought that your stock was going to go down 50%, then why would you split it to 50 and watch it to go to 25? Like that doesn't make any sense. So a split is basically a statement by company management that they are bullish on their own stock, that they think it is going to keep going up, right? Which if management is bullish on the stock, then you should probably be bullish on the stock. So People buying a stock on an announcement of a stock split, it's, it's perfectly rational. Like, it makes perfect sense. Like, it's actually bullish. So, you have some people like, I won't name any names, but kind of these, you know, finance nerds who say, well, it doesn't mean anything. It's just accounting. And no, there's, there's actually, there's real value in it. So, so I saw this chart comparison between Cisco and NVIDIA. Do you think this could be the next Cisco? What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, it's going to be the next. I mean, I've been saying in the newsletter, like, the 75% drawdown is coming. Like, it's absolutely coming. Um, I, I would love to share something else. It's going to be in my newsletter tomorrow. I can't share it. Um, but let's just say there's a lot of evidence that high-flying stocks like this tend to not do so well in the future. So... Right. Um, yeah. You spoke a little on the Fed meeting tomorrow, which you said was probably going to be kind of more of a boring meeting. But any thoughts on CPI? You know, there's 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 sort of a school of thought that we're going to be higher for longer in rates, and uh, you know we're we're going to have hot inflation numbers, and we're going to have hot growth numbers, and uh, the bond market is going to stay have elevated yields and. I don't know. I tend to, I tend to think that is, you know, I look to where the consensus is and I tend to think that that's the consensus that I think more people are anticipating higher yields. Um, I think there would probably be a more asymmetrical reaction if we had lower CPI than if we had higher CPI. For example, if CPI comes in at 3.3 or lower, uh, I think that gets a more positive reaction out of the bond market than you get a negative reaction on a, a stronger number, if you know what I mean. So, All right, let's get down to the main topics. So you sent over some, some topics yesterday, and I want to discuss the minimum wage laws in California. So according to new findings by the California Business and, Indu and Industrial Alliance, the state of California has lost nearly 10,000 fast food jobs since Assembly Bill 1228 the new $20 minimum wage for fast food employees was first signed into law late last year. So this has sparked companies like Chipotle and McDonald's to raise their prices. Others are investing in automatic kiosks and other automated devices to help reduce the number of employees while some stores outright closed. And most notable, there have been a number of layoffs. Thousands of Pizza Hut drivers have been replaced by services such as DoorDash and Uber Eats. And also, as a follow-up, is fast food becoming more of a luxury? Yeah, I mean, I don't know why we haven't figured this out yet. Like, this has been demonstrated over and over and over again 
that raising the minimum wage in any sector results in job losses like all the time. If you're a business and you can spend $30 an hour on labor, you can either employ three people at $10 an hour or two people at $15 an hour. And the person that you're not employing um, goes on assistance and then they're getting paid from taxpayers, which is not a good result. Then they don't have a job. So, um, yeah, I mean, we keep doing this over and over again. And California, I think, out of all states, is probably the tops in economic illiteracy. Um, you know, actually, as I, I was scrolled by a, um, a headline the other day that said that that somebody got a 30, I think it was like a $39 bowl at Chipotle or something like that. Jesus. <laughs> so, I mean, California, look, I mean, they, they are always one law away from utopia, right? Like pe- just, let's just pass one more law and utopia will be reached. And meanwhile, it is the most expensive state in the country and the probably the most expensive place in the world to do business. And prices are very high. And people are leaving California. They lost 500,000 people last year. They're going to lose another 500,000 people this year. And the consequences of that are political. You know, when they do the next census and they do the redistricting, California is going to lose like 10 representatives, you know, and it's because of actions like this that force people out of the state. So Costco is, has been accused of greedflation, wholesale reports, uh, increase in earnings while hiking up prices. So there's a lot of talk of like, about terms like shrinkflation and greedflation. Can you speak a little bit about psychological aspects of raising prices? Well, so th- there is there look, th- there there is a psychological basis for businesses to raise raise prices even if they don't have to. And first of all, let me say that the right price for a business to charge somebody for a product is the highest one possible that they can get away with. Just from a moral and ethical standpoint, they are obligated to charge the highest price possible, okay? If they charge too high of a price, then people don't buy the product, and they charge too high of a price, right? So where am I going with this? Um, Let's say you have two companies. You have company A and company B, and company A is getting some inflation pressures in its supply chain, and it has to raise prices, And company B, for whatever reason, is not experiencing those same inflationary pressures, right? But they make the same product as company A. Company A just raised their prices. They have the ability to raise prices to match company A. So they should raise their prices, even though they're not experiencing those price pressures, they should raise prices to be commensurate with company A. Right. And people are calling that like greedflation. Some people call it price gouging. And really what companies have had over the last uh, probably three or four years since the pandemic is they've had pricing power. They've had the ability to raise prices and people have accepted those prices and they paid those prices. But now we're running into a wall, right, where the thirty nine dollar Chipotle bowl Right. And people look at that and they say, I'm not paying that. We've reached the limit of what people are willing to pay and businesses are losing pricing power. And you, in, in the fast food world, there's there's a lot of businesses that are actually cutting prices now. So really, that's where you get deflationary pressures is where people push back against those price increases. And this is really the first time this has happened in the last three or four years. I think people are starting to avoid McDonald's too. Those prices have been going up big time lately. Yeah. I, uh, I go to McDonald's from time to time. I get a double cheeseburger. It's like $3 and 50 cents. Um, the big Macs are like six bucks. It's expensive. I mean, if you got two big Macs and a fries and a soda, it's like 16 bucks. Like it's, it's a lot. You you used to be able to get a drink for like a dollar. And I think they're like at least three bucks now. I know. I know. And they're not, can't get that sweet McDonald's Coke fix for cheap anymore. (laughs) Sucks. <laughs> so um, on Thursday, you are releasing your next Jared Dillian letter. We talk about driving a kind of a POS car and the benefits of that. Specifically, though, what are your thoughts on financing used cars? Financing used cars is generally not a good idea. 
Um, and I mean, look, if it's, if it's a car that is coming off a lease and it's three years old, or it's a car that's a year old or two years old, that's one thing. Um, but if you're, if you're buying a 10 or 12 year old car that is, you know, fully depreciated and you're financing it, like you're going to not only going to pay a lot in interest, but there's a pretty good chance you're going to be paying a lot in maintenance too. It just doesn't make a lot of sense. So if you're going to be buying a used car that's old, you know, 10 years or more, just pay cash. There's no reason to finance that whatsoever. It's not an expensive car. Just on it, like just absolutely pay cash for it. How much life do you think you're going to get out of that Highlander you're driving? What's it? 120,000 miles. You said, yeah, I mean, it runs fine. Um, I would, I honestly, I would like to get a new car. I'm a little short on cash right now. Um, so the car runs fine. I'll probably drive it at least another two years. I mean, the thing is, is that now, since I've moved into the new house, I don't really drive anymore. Like I, so, you know, I, I was putting like 20,000 miles a year on that car and now I'll probably put like 3000 miles a year on the car. So yeah, same situation here since, since I've gotten work from home, I do not drive that much anymore. So, so I actually called my insurance company which is USAA. And I said, look, you know, because you estimate how many miles you drive a year on the car. And I said, I want to lower it to 5,000 and my car insurance went down by 350 bucks a year. So, wow. I need to look into that, especially in Florida. I mean, auto insurance rates are insane down here. Yeah. Another thing you, you wrote that I had not heard about at all. Um, is that dry cleaners are going out of business in Polly's Island? What's what's up with that? Yeah, I used to go to this place called Lapels, um, and you know, I just for context, I wore I used to wear suits to work all the time until the pandemic, and then I switched to casual clothes. So you know, up until 2020, I was wearing suits to work all the time, and. I was like the dry cleaners biggest customer. I would go like once every two weeks and take 10 shirts and some pants and stuff like that. Um, and then after the pandemic, I just never went back. Well, that place is out of business. Um, so I, so I, I, you know, Googled more dry cleaners in Pauly's Island. I went to another one, went up to the door and there's, and there was a sign saying we're closing forever on June 15th. So there's only one left in Pauly's Island. So I went to that one. So honestly, I think it's just a function of people just don't wear dress clothes anymore. You know what I mean? Yep. Like I, th I think pre pandemic people used to wear dress clothes and now nobody does. And yeah, like two out of three dry cleaners go out of business. Jeez. All right. Let's get into the mailbag. Just a couple of quick questions here. The first one is from Bob. Where do the wealthy put their gigantic savings when the insurance limits are 250 K is there a better way than having multiple accounts at different banks? The answer is no, there isn't. I mean, there there is and there isn't. Okay, first of all, uh, Giannis Antetokounmpo, the basketball player, the Greek freak, right? So he's from Greece. He doesn't trust banks because in, in Greece, banks fail, right? And they don't have deposit insurance in Greece. At least I don't think so. So when he came to the U.S. and he started making a lot of money, he opened bank accounts in like 50 different banks and put 250000 in them just, just, to, just to get around the FDIC rules. The other thing you can do is you can put it in a money market fund. Now, a money market fund is not FDIC insured, um, but money market funds, really the only time money market funds have not been safe are the day that Lehman crashed during the financial crisis, in which case the Fed backstopped the entire money market system. So really, I would say money market funds are the next best thing to a bank account. And those obviously have no limits. You can put as much as you want into a money market fund, and you're going to get basically, you'll probably get a better interest rate than you do in the bank. Next up from Paul. What are your thoughts on the dollar losing its status as the reserve currency? If it happened, how would it affect us? And is there anything we could do to protect ourselves? Um, this is, I, I really, I hate this question. Um, it's people, 
people get sweaty palms about this. They like to talk about, you know, uh, it was funny. I was, um, I was listening to like a right wing radio station today. And, um, uh, there was a guy from bright part, bright Bart, on uh, who was a guest on the radio show. And he was saying that the dollar is losing its value. And I was like, dude, have you seen a chart of the dollar lately? It is absolutely not losing its value. In fact, it's doing pretty well. Have you gone to Europe? Have you seen how cheap it is to travel to Europe or anywhere else in the world? The dollar is very strong. Like this question about like, is the dollar going to lose its reserve currency status? Like of all the times to ask this question, this is the weirdest time. Like, because we are probably the furthest away from that, right? Now, let's say we get into election season and we have some political instability and we have wars and stuff like that. And, uh, you know, Trump, by the way, Trump has explicitly said he wants the dollar to be weaker. And when he was president, he he basically jawboned the dollar down about 10 percent. So let's say Trump is president and he's talking down the dollar. Then I think it's a reasonable time to ask that question. But not right now. Right. Uh, anything on your radar in the week ahead? I know we got a ton of tech earnings coming up in July, but nothing too notable in terms of earnings next week. No, I wish there was something going on. It's actually quite boring. Um, I've been working on my books, um, working on music, mostly working on my books, uh, I've, working I've on s- night moves. I've um, seen you've posted some samples of that. How's that? Yeah. How's that coming along? Is it is it complete? Or are you just you're still going through editing and it's uh, the editing is now done as of like two days ago. The editing is done. How did you like the samples? They're good. I mean, uh, are you are you just kind of going going to go into marketing mode here? Like uh, since it's coming out in November, it sounds like it's pretty close to being done here. So, well, first of all, um, it's going to come out in either October or December. I realize that releasing it around election day is probably a bad idea. Yeah. Um, so, so I might do October. I might do December. I haven't decided yet. Cool. Um, but the book is done. Uh, I need to do the back cover. I need to get blurbs. I'm in the process of getting blurbs. Um, it's exciting stuff. But I'm I'm always in marketing mode. Like for if for whatever I'm doing at the time, I'm always in marketing mode. But I, you know, I just look. Those bastards sold five thousand copies. Um, I think this will sell a little bit less. Not as many people read fiction. Um, so I think if this sold three thousand copies, that would be a win. You know, definitely. So, how many copies did No Worries end up selling, or to date? Uh, to date, about fifteen thousand. So damn, that's not bad. Yep. But yeah, like you said, it's it's a lot harder to sell fiction these days. Yeah. But I'm definitely looking forward to that. That's exciting stuff. All right. Um, anything else you got on your mind before we wrap this thing up? Hey, if you're if you're you know, look, we have a lot of people that listen to the podcast um who are kind of lurkers. Um, they don't subscribe to the newsletters, they don't buy anything, they've never gotten the bond master class or the awesome portfolio or anything. You know, I would I would just say, you know, think about it. Like just get off the fence, give it a try. Uh you don't have to buy the most expensive thing on the menu. You can start with something cheaper like the strategic portfolio or something like that. See how you like it. Um but yeah, um you know, the podcast is something we do for free. Um, love going on the air and t- talking about stuff, but yeah, I would say, you know, think about it. If you've never tried any, any of our stuff out. Definitely. All right. Well, thank you, Jared. Uh, everyone like subscribe, drop comments below any topics you want us to cover, hit the notification bell. You know, the deal, Jared, I will talk to you soon and we'll be back next week. 